So, so to talk about advances in AI and how we'll see this impact in uh, enterprise, let's start first with where AI started itself. And so, uh, you know, let's go back a decade ago into, you know, this thing called TikTok, which, you know, of course, most recently we hear of it as a current, as an app. Uh, it, its name comes from Frank Baum's Visit for Pause series, in fact, Osmo Pause back in 1907. And uh, in fact, the name term robot came from RUR, a 1920 play back in, uh, you know, Russia. Moving, moving ahead a little bit, you know, talking about AI, of course, the Turing tests come to mind. It was originally called an imitation game where, you know, where we were trying to compare, look at two different people and identify who is who. In this case, it then it got morphed into, could you have a computer and a person where it was hard for a person to see to actually say who between those two is the computer and who is the real person. Of course, moving ahead, uh, you know, many of you might be familiar with the movie China, and uh, you know, this is just Alex Garland's take on the Turing test itself. And we see changes like this happening over time, of course. Uh, continuing ahead in the 1950s, this is where a lot of progress happened in AI, especially in terms of, uh, you know, how people were thinking of it conceptually. It was a very, you know, the Dartmouth conference was very influential, driven by Marvin Minsky and John McCarthy. It set this direction of where AI was going for the next few decades. In fact, the term AI itself was coined for this conference by John McCarthy. Move ahead a decade, and uh, you know there was this chatbot, Eliza. You're of course you know familiar with lots of chatbots now. This was one of the first ones created. It was a very early conversational system, but it impressed lots of folks. It was really meant to be very superficial by Dr. Weizenbaum when he created this, but it ended up feeling very real. You know, especially uh, the doctor script that you see here, where people uh, you know it's posed as a psychotherapist. The name itself came from Eliza Doolittle in G.B. Shaw's play Pygmalion that was made into My Fair Lady release around just around the same time. Uh, so that's a clip from uh, My Fair Lady. Uh, algorithm. Earliest example of what's called experts. This automated the behavior of organic cats. The idea was that expert systems, that an expert created a knowledge base that can be leveraged by an inference engine, typically a simple rules engine that could answer user queries. The work on dendril and mycin enshrined expert systems at the leading area of AI research over the next couple of decades. So let's move ahead, uh, you know, moving from there much closer, a decade ago, last decade, and we see things changing a fair bit. You, you know, while the core idea of neural networks dates back to the 1940s, back in the 60s, Minsky and Papert wrote a book on connectionism in 1969, and they critiqued this area, and that really pushed this to the background while expert systems gained prominence. It wasn't until the 80s with new ideas from John Hubfield, David Rubelhart, that led to its resurgence. Of course, it still took a few more decades to really come to the forefront as what it's known now, often uh, deep learning. And the last decade has really seen a huge uptick and changes in what, what's happened here. So uh, let's look at what it's changed and let's look at what it's brought for us over those, these years. So the first part, of course, is, you know, it's really learned, to helped us learn to see. And if you think about back in 2011, we had, uh, you know, if you had these models that were trying to see and understand what's there in a, in a picture, there were still huge errors, you know, 26% errors versus humans only have percent errors for those kind of images. And, uh, you know, that's sort of like seeing this blurry image, but we've gone from that to this, where we can actually see this very, very clearly and uh, you know, going from that to this this crazy change, 
if you remember in the evolutionary biology, the time when animals first evolved, uh, it was a time of great change. We saw huge evolution with lots and lots of new species being created. It had a dramatic effect. And that's the same kind of thing that we're seeing in machines in so many different ways. What we can accomplish, it's just very, very exciting. Let me just give you one example of, you know, what it's accomplished, of course, in terms of real products, what it's allowed us to do. Uh, you know, Google Photo Photos comes up as a very common example where, uh, you know, now there used to be a time where we had to label everything all of them ourselves. Now all of that is the picture. You take a picture, it figures out what's in there. You can do searches for dogs. In this case, it can recognize glaciers, it can recognize all kinds of things. And, uh, you know, the, the next part for us, of course, as a sensor, sensory thing is just learning to hear. And this, again, is something that it's made a lot of progress on. Uh, deep learning has really, really helped. In fact, one year in 2012, the move to deep learning from the prior techniques was almost like an improvement of 20 years of research in this area, talking to researchers in that field. And that, that's, of course, led to things like us being able to call uh, or ask instead of having to type everything. And, and uh, in uh, the flip side of it, in terms of you know the speech generation part uh, and understanding, we can do captioning, et cetera. For example, in this case, uh, you might be able to see this uh, you know, on your phone. You have videos that you can't hear, you're hard of hearing, or you're in a place where you can't um, have the audio on. You can see this in a caption uh, very, very easily as well. Uh, and this is happening right on the phone in this particular example. The, um, another example is you know, about understanding language and uh, you know, going from the vision to just converting speech to language itself. Of course, language plays a key role in us and in, in what we do. And again, over the last couple of years, we are seeing Oops. And over the last couple of years, we've seen huge progress in uh, you know, what we see with uh, reading comprehension and other techniques like this. Uh, most recently, of course, there's a lot of talk about this module called GPT-3 that can do all kinds of things in terms of conversational stuff, etc. Uh, this particular data set comes from uh, Stanford. There's a question answering data set, basically, where the human performance, as you can see, is listed here. It started in 2018. And just in a couple of years, we've seen things progress from going past human performance to way better than that. So, you know, what this says basically is, uh, if I had to take a test there, uh, with which needed reading comprehension, probably, you know, at least as well, or perhaps better. Um, of course, the tests themselves aren't going to be changing anytime soon, and we'll still be taking them. But this is just just shows how far we've come with computers, with AI, in lots of different ways. Of course, it has very real implications and some exciting, you know, from respective search. Of course, if you uh, look at Google, and this is an example pre bert and after bert This is a, a model that really changed the game in terms of language understanding. Do you know Before we had this model, uh, and you can see that it matches the keywords, but doesn't quite get the context fully. Whereas after it really gets the entire sentence and can understand what's going on. Of course, it's applicable in lots of areas. Uh, one of the areas that we see it being applied very much now is uh, the assistance, both uh, you know, Alexa or Amazon Echoes or the Google Assistant uh, in Google Homes. And th this is an area that we we'll, we expect to continue to uh, rapidly progress uh, because of advances in many many of these different areas, including speech, uh, you know, natural language, and all of these together. Now moving on, so so one of the questions that comes up is we've talked about this history. Why did this happen now? You know, why did we see these huge changes, huge improvements over the last decade, especially? And if you, let's take a brief look at what's been happening and so on. And, uh, you know, <clears throat> it, if you're not familiar with these three folks, these they, they are basically Jan LeCun, Jeffrey Hinton, and Joshua Bengio. They won the Turing Award in 2018 for their work on deep learning. 
Each of them, uh, you know, were responsible for laying the foundations for all the improvements in algorithms that led to resurgence and growth of neural networks, especially over the last decade, but they've been laying these foundations for the last several decades for us to bring, to get to this place. So algorithms is one area. Uh, you know, we were seeing those examples about images, the 26% going to 3%. Uh, a lot of that came from those, those numbers themselves were from this data set, our test on this data set. This data set had a million images, still has a million images, I guess, from thousand different kinds of classes. And it uh, allows people, it allowed people to really iterate on things and iterate on uh, And that's really, you know, and so data really definitely has been part of that. In fact, so much so that, you know, we have cartons like this, of course, that, that talk about, um, you know, we, we've been trying to use data for every single thing. Of course, uh, I hope we aren't going to be trying to do this uh, for uh, self-driving cars, but uh, there are lots and lots of things that we are seeing people generate this data, create these data sets because they make a huge difference in how we can move things forward. Uh, now, the third piece that is uh, as important as the computation power. That increased over time. Of course, there was the Moore's law that helped Right. Yes, you, we have we have a problem with with the connection, and we lost the, your PowerPoint. Could you uh, share it again in, uh, in in Zoom? It's just sharing sure. the presentation. Sure. Uh, let's check if it's working here because we, we don't receive the, the PowerPoint. We don't receive the slides. It's okay now. Okay, it's working now. And uh, do, do I continue from here? Or would you like me to go back a little? No, 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 it's, it, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. You, you can continue in, in okay. the place you can just work. keep going. Yeah. Okay, all right, awesome. So, uh, you know, the next piece here, of course, is Thank the you. computational power. Uh, and uh, that is an important one where we see the, you know, this going, Moore's law has helped us really improve things over the last several decades. That itself is slowing down, but we've seen lots of specialization for deep learning itself. You know, we saw lots of GPUs uh, and TPUs that have really made things different. And in this example, you see a TPU part that's over a hundred petaflops. This is as fast as you know some of the supercomputers in the top ten in the world. And with thirty-two terabytes of memory and custom uh, network itself, it, it's allowed. Uh, the researchers to really push the state of the art to allow us to do lots of exciting things and to see what's possible. Um, and so, you know, we talked about compute. Really, there are three things, the algorithms, the data, and the compute that have really come together. Of course, they've been further enabled by tools like TensorFlow that make it possible for developers and researchers to really do some amazing things. Uh, along to leverage these different pieces. So let's take a look at some of the products uh, that we've seen these uh, play out in and really make a difference in. And here, you know, these are, you know, both on the translate side. So in this case, in both of these, this is running on It's pretty amazing. You can go from that crazy supercomputer all the way to the phone and these parts on the phone themselves translating whatever's there on that screen. I can point phone at that in life. Text that understands what text is in there, converts it to the right language that I care about, and in fact, displays it there as well using air. Uh, in the, the next example there, you see it's overlaid on any app that, that you have text on. It can just convert things right away, right there. And, uh, you know, here's another example. That's a photo booth that was launched a couple of years ago. In this case, it's recognizing when everybody is actually, you know, it can take a picture automatically when everybody is smiling, everybody's eyes are open. So it's not, uh, you don't have to wait and you don't have to judge and get the right thing. It's just going to figure that out automatically. Uh, here's, uh, you know, some of the hardware that like Google last year. And, uh, you know, really every one of them in many different ways, the assistance, of course, for voice, for speech understanding, uh, the, you know, the phones for their camera, for all kinds of apps. 
And we, AI has been used in all of these in many, many, many different ways. Moving on to healthcare, which is of course something near and dear to us in lots of ways. Uh, you know, one of the things that was applied, one of the early applications in healthcare was around uh, detecting what are the most common diseases of the eye. In this case, uh, you know, these images are of the back of the eye, the fundal images. And uh, there's this disease called diabetic retinopathy. The, the one on the right is slightly diseased. And uh, it's hard to, you know, for a doctor, of course, they can look at it, they know these dark spotches are there and they can help it recognize that. If this is uh, recognized early enough, then it can be cured very, very easily. However, if left un unchecked, then it can actually lead to blindness as well. And given that there are so many different places in the world that have access to the same doctors and stuff, this is very and, and bring that same uh, expertise and to, to many different parts of the world as well. Uh, you know, something that's happening right now, of course, with COVID-19. Uh, there are lots of, there's lots of research happening and there are lots of companies that are helping both on the identification side, in this case, from uh, x-rays being able to identify that there's a high risk of COVID-19. Uh, but there's lots of other work happening also in terms of the vaccine finding and uh, building new medicine as well. So we talked about a lot of these different things. Let's, let's look at what, how we can think about in the enterprise itself and what would work well. Uh, so, you know, is there something missing really? You know, if you think about going back to this particular slide, all these pieces, do we, does this work in the enterprise as well, or are there things that are missing and we really need to change things? So, so let's take a look at each of them one by one. You know, the first one, of course, TensorFlow, it's an open source tool. It's available to everybody. Uh, so it's, it's really possible for anybody, whether it's a researcher at a big company or an enterprise to pick it up and start using it. And we're seeing lots of that. Uh, algorithms themselves, they also are available Along with tools like TensorFlow, most people, when they, most uh, researchers now, when they publish or they talk about their algorithms, publish their papers, also publish the code or, or other people actually implement those papers again. So they are also available in the open source for lots of people to use. Uh, compute itself, of course, not everybody has access to the same kind of supercomputer, but you can rent it out. So with public clouds like uh, AWS, Google, or Azure, you really have access, anybody out there now has access to the same kind of compute that's available to these higher, to the, these big companies. And they can do some interesting and exciting things with those. Um, now, data, that's the next thing that we uh, think about. And uh, so we do have lots of data. In fact, you know, with big things, there's, uh, uh, probably lots of other talks about how people are collecting the data and how people can leverage this more effectively as well. Uh, in you know, even though sometimes it might feel like, oh, there's just too much data and how do we manage it? That has made a lot of progress over the last decade as well. And so uh, there are lots of tools around managing data lakes, managing data warehouses. There's lots of ways that we can manage and organize the data that we have and keep it clean. And so we can, we have uh, all the pieces really coming together in terms of uh, that we see here in terms of making AI available in the enterprise and making it useful. So is there something else we need to leverage AI? Well, yes, we do need people. Not everyone can use to put all this together. They, are, they just aren't enough data scientists to build everything we would like to do. There's, of course, lots of work going on to make these simpler. We have tools like the ones that you see here, which leverage auto ML techniques from lots of different vendors. They definitely help. However, there's lots more work required to make machine learning work end to end. Of course, to understand this, how this may work best, let's take a look again at where the tech companies have been applying that. It's in their products, which is where they shine the most. For Google, where, whether it's in the hardware products shown here, or search, YouTube, Play Store, is all about how can AI make more products more useful. 
it's really no different than the rest of the business and it comes down to what's the core competency for the business itself so for mastercard fraud is a key part of their business and something their customers rely on them for Nike's marketing prowess is something it really focuses on and continues to leverage AI to improve its direct to consumer outreach. So when we think about uh, AI and how we're going to leverage it, what we're going to do about it in the enterprise, we need to think about the same build versus buy decisions that we used to think about for software, for example. For core areas, building the competency in-house is extremely important. For example, for MasterCard, it needs to build the, and own the best fraud detection systems. However, for many of the other areas, it can buy pre-built solutions. Example, for marketing, it may be able to rely on tools from other vendors. Whereas in the case of Nike, their core competency is marketing, hence they should double down on the internal efforts, even within external tools. This is the same when it comes to AI. It is important to leverage the best technology for the core competency not to outsource it. Over the last few years, we've seen a lot of the B2C products start to integrate AI to make them better. And we saw some of the examples prior and earlier in the stock itself. Uh, and this is because of a number of reasons. So let's start with the first one, data, of course. B2C companies often have a lot more data because they have lots, lots of users. So they have a lot more data to start with. Uh, the good thing about you know, image data sets that we were talking about, some examples that we saw, especially for B2C companies, is that learning is very easily transformed from one to another. For example, modern trained by top companies like Google or Facebook can be leveraged by many other companies without having to do the same kind of work over and over again. And the same kind of thing is true for language as well. You know, English or Spanish are really the same, whoever speaks it and whatever you want to do with it. This is an example of a consumer product, photos management software, going through some iterations. Picasa started as a desktop application. While it moved to cloud, Flickr did much better in that space. It did, you know, as it uh, built something ground up there. Of course, over the last few years, we've seen Google Photos become very popular, primarily by starting with leveraging machine learning for auto labeling and showing this, these results to you. And it makes a huge difference in how we interact with the application. Looking at the business to business side of things, of course, I, I believe we'll see the same kind of thing with B2B products over this decade. Similar to what we saw in the move from the on-prem offerings to, to software as a service offerings. In fact, given it's a lot easier to build and integrate AI in the cloud, we see it showing up much quicker in these software as a service products. We'll also see a lot more technology startups rebuilding some of these applications from the ground up to leverage AI in new and interesting ways. Let's take a couple of examples. So um, on the HR software side, we saw you know, decades ago, PeopleSoft was sort of the, you know, the software that you installed, that you ran and stuff. And over time again, while it's tried to move to the cloud, offer a cloud service, et cetera, Workday came up and really leveraged that move to the cloud itself. And more recently now, we are seeing companies like Eightfold uh, disrupt that space in very different ways, leveraging AI in rethinking what can be offered in that space itself. Another example is uh, CRM. You know, Siebel is, of course, very well known for CRM now. Uh, in fact, both PeopleSoft and Siebel are owned by Oracle. But the CRM space was disrupted by Salesforce, which came in as a cloud provider, which came in with these offerings directly in the cloud itself and were able to offer this. And so, you know, look forward to seeing what's next there. How do people disrupt that? It, leveraging AI from the ground up. We expect to see a lot more of this in lots of different ways in uh, many of these areas as well. Um, you know, I would love to leave you with uh, something here. You know, while it's tempting to expect AI to solve all our problems, I want to leave you with this last message on this. You know, AI makes computers a lot like us, a lot more like us in more ways than we like. You know, so while we would want it to solve our problems, there are lots of other interesting ones that come with it. That's it. Thank you.